We are about to go through everything that struck Carl and Rush about Tesla and there is no one else who ranks higher on Wall Street that also analyzes Tesla's stock. So let's take a look. Colin Rush from Oppenheimer. One of the things I was struck by in the presentation was the, the operational efficiency metrics that you guys are talking about. Can you talk a little bit about the velocity of learning cycles and how you guys track that and, and think about that as an organization as you work into a variety of other areas from, from an innovation perspective? You can't improve something you don't measure, and we're like ruthless measurers at Tesla. And um, once you start measuring things that contribute to operational efficiency, you actually have a path to doing something about it. I took everything from the investor day that struck Colin, and I never used any of these before except the clip at the very end. If we look at the SGNA side of this, um, I think the story here is pretty dramatic. So we're showing here a comparison of SG&A per car delivered compared to the traditional auto industry, which is both an OEM and the dealership network. And our estimates are that we're 60 to 70 percent lower on a per car basis. And if you turn this into dollars, this is many thousands of dollars per car. This is part of the reason why on the last earnings call, I made the comment that we think about operating margin more so than gross margin as a company because the uh, the integration that we have here on the SG&A side, particularly with vertical integration into our dealership network, this provides efficiencies that um, give us a competitive advantage from a cost structure standpoint relative to other companies. Zach's presentation was at the end of the Investor Day, and I believe no one really paid attention to it because of that. But this, I believe, is specifically what struck Colin, as well as all the other things in this video. From here on, I won't interrupt. Enjoy. The other thing that I'll note here is that this wasn't always the case. And it wasn't that long ago where these bars would be inverted. And if we go back a little bit in time, and we talk about when we launched Model 3 in the Fremont factory, we went from 2,000 cars per week, which was SNX, adding 5,000 a week to that for Model 3, got us to 7,000 cars a week. You've heard some folks here today talk about production hell. What I don't think we've ever talked about as a company is back office operations hell, which also happened at the same time. And 7,000 cars a week, 350,000 cars a year, we want to go to 20 million cars a year, and we're struggling at 7,000. And we're saying to ourselves, we have to completely rethink the way that we're managing our back office operations if we have any hope of efficiently scaling this company. And so this began a process that we're still continuing to work on today, but it's something that we refer to as the Tesla operating system. So in the same way that we're vertically integrated into the software that manages our cars, we've also vertically integrated into the software that runs our company. And all of our major uh, departments in the company are using, uh, not all of them yet, but almost all of them are using our in-house software. Most recently, we uh, removed third-party recruiting software, and we're now running our own recruiting software as a company. And this matters a lot because Rather than having a complex web of third-party systems that are generic solution that take a lot of effort to customize for our particular needs, we've been able to put in place with an in-house applications engineering team dedicated lightweight software that does only what we needed to do and nothing more. And that team works very closely with process improvement teams that sit within the business who are looking through all of the processes that we're managing as a company and following the exact same process that Tom mentioned in the manufacturing space to look at our processes, delete process steps that we don't need, simplify process steps that are existing, and automate what's remaining. And the results of this have been quite staggering, to be frank. I think it's exceeded our expectations as well. Uh, on the left side of this chart are some examples of the efficiency improvements that we've seen within our SG&A areas as a result of this strategy. The North American sales team is four times more efficient now than they were in 2018. Uh, order operations team, financial services, I mean, these levels of improvement are large, and I don't, there's not enough pixels on the slide here to list out everything, so it's just a couple of examples. And then in the same way that when we look to take cost out of our products, we want to feature up the product or improve the product while taking cost out, the same has been true with the use of Tesla operating system and that integration with our process improvement teams within the company. And so we've in increased performance and added capabilities while also dramatically reducing cost on a per car basis. There's a list of self-service functionality that we've put in place, which customers like. It also simplifies our operations behind the scenes. We've used the Tesla operating system to expand into our captive insurance space, which we are fully vertically integrated into. 
We run our own in-house software. We have our own agents, our own claims software, and, own, and, and claims folks who run our insurance business. This is also very important because as a technology company, data is very important. And uh, we use these systems and the access to the data in those systems to pull out extremely granular and targeted reporting that enables us to see every aspect of our business in real time so we can make adjustments to our operations as needed. And there are sometimes examples where we say, man, I wish we were tracking this piece of data. Well, you know, it's a team's meeting away from the applications engineering team to make a request, and then we can start tracking that data and make those changes. And so the feedback loop associated with process improvement inside the company is, is pretty astounding. The last thing I'll just mention here, which is something I'm personally quite proud of, we've made a lot of progress in our closed processes within the finance team, getting our 10Q and 10K filed, it's amongst the fastest of the 20 largest market cap companies, so great work to the finance team here. So all of this work on cost reduction is extremely important because we have a lot of money to spend ahead of us to achieve our goals uh, within the master plan. So we've mentioned over the course of the day today 20 million annual vehicle production as our target, one terawatt hour of annual energy storage production, and then expanding cell production, service, and charging in line with the growth of those other businesses. And so we've estimated what we think the total cost to get there will be, and there's certainly error bars around these numbers as, uh, as we continue to progress and innovate, but of this, we've spent about $28 billion of that so far in the history of the company. And maybe this total investment looks large. I actually think it's quite small relative to our ambitions, and if you look at our 2022 operating cash flows and you, you just say, well, let's assume some modest growth to that, maybe not all that much, uh, if you're being conservative, but the ability to pay for this level of investment uh, from the forecast that we have is, is very achievable for us. Once we install a site, we also operate it really efficiently. Over the last few years, we've been able to cut our per kilowatt hour cost by 40%. Again, a lot of reasons for this, but one at the top of the list is we've focused on increasing our site utilization. Site utilization is just how many sessions or kilowatt hours can we push through a site or a post. And basically doing that allows us to spread our cost over more sessions, thus lower cost per kilowatt hour. But of course, that's easier said than done because when we push up site efficiency, of course, the risk is that we, we have a poor customer experience and we have wait time at our sites. This is where Trip Planner comes in. Trip Planner is our in-vehicle routing or navigation system. Other electric vehicle manufacturers, well, some of them have vehicle side data. Other infrastructure providers have site data. But at Tesla, we have both. And what that allows us to do is to use Trip Planner to route vehicles towards available sites and away from congested sites so we can balance our utilization without risking wait time. And the results speak for themselves. Over the last few years, we've been able to drive up site utilization by 30%. That means lower per kilowatt hour cost, while also cutting our wait time in half. Um, people always ask me you know, how Tesla can build a factory that fast. Really, um, we learned from um, our Fremont factory a lot. We talked to the survivor from the production hell and um, tried to avoid all the mistakes we made. Um, and um, we decided to design a straight line with the minimum number of up and downs and turns for easier manufacturing ability and easier construction. We also challenged all the assumptions that people ever know to build a vehicle factory um, when we delete and simplified um, all the redundancies and the buffers. Um, that's helped us to save a lot of time. Um, also, we have a, a very strong in-house uh, construction team um, in Tesla. Um, if they're um, Ever a job cannot be done by others better, and we bring this in-house. So we have this in-house construction team um, have a full control over all the activities on sites, from um, design, engineering to construction, uh, site management. Um, so this team not uh, didn't just build Giga Shanghai; they also built uh, Giga Berlin, Giga Texas, and uh, Giga Nevada. Um, and um, they're really the hero behind the scenes. And the faster we ramp, um, the faster we can get the economy of scale. Um, if you look at um, the chart on the, right, uh, on the left, um, Shanghai um, be able to significantly drop our labor hours per car um, during the ramp. Um, the little dip there has happened in the last um, Q2 2022 um, because of the, the COVID shutdown. 
Um, and on the right is the Fremont um, Model Y shop. Even this is a 60-year-old facility, the team there still be able to optimize the material flow, eliminate all the um, single point of failure, and to drive higher outputs, um, hence um, reduce the labor hours. Um, and actually, this factory keep setting a new record. Um, yesterday, they just had a new factory daily record. We follow the philosophy um, Elon shared about the building rockets, which is questioning, basically find the right problem to solve, and we start with delete, simplify, then we try to accelerate, pressurize the line, and find the, um, if the, the solution actually work. And at last, we think about the automation. Um, I, there's one example in um, Gigafactory Shanghai. Um, in the paint shop, we find that there's an um, um, overlap um, baking range between uh, the um, PVC sealer um, and the top coat. Uh, it was done by two different ovens. And we decided to combine the two processes, um, eventually that helped us, um, didn't just help us to reduce the cycle time, but also save the 9% of energy consumption and the 9% of the, um, CO2 emission. We have an integrated um, global organization from, um, from production all the way um, to sales and delivery service. Uh, this will help us to strengthen the feedback loop um, between manufacturing and the service. We obviously uh, want to bring a delight for customer uh, ownership experience um, to our um, uh, car owners. Um, and um, um, with this direct feedback loop, we um, be able to turn customer escalations and the feedback into a quick actions improvement on the shop floor immediately. Um, with that effort, in the past six months, we'll be able to reduce the time in service um, and um, early ownership service, um, also service appointment wait time significantly. Remember Battery Day, we showed this video with the spoon uh, and how we went from dry powder to film. Let's just say there's no spoon now. So uh, many of you in this room saw uh, this on your tour today, but you know, here is our dry electrode machine here in Texas, one of the lines we have installed here. Fully automated, no spoon, from powder and foil in to coated electrode out. Um, uh, from, from a peak productivity perspective, per tool perspective, this is over 20 times the productivity of the tools that we showed folks on the tour uh, in Cato back in Battery Day. So we've made a lot of progress on the, the key one of the key parts of the cell manufacturing process. From typical 2170 cylindrical cells to 468, we made a huge leap, which is basically a 5x reduction in the factory footprint um, and volume and, volume and footprint. Um, and then from going from what we did in Fremont and our pilot line to Texas, we improved further and we're improving again when we go into Nevada. And what this actually represents is uh, a series of actions taken by a very integrated, holistic, uh, design team across you know, the product design, the manufacturing design, the process design, the equipment design, and the facility design. They all need to work together to make this happen. A relentless focus on speed of execution, and, and there's two points to be made here. First one is in building factories. What you're seeing here is a time lapse of the mega factory that was built in Lathrop. We took it from a JCPenney distribution center to a world-class manufacturing facility in less than 12 months, which is, which is incredible. And really, the, the way that we did this is similar to what my colleagues have described. It's, it's leveraging the vertical integration of Tesla. It's, it's getting the vehicle manufacturing team in the same room as construction and engineering and making decisions quickly with all the, decision, with all the stakeholders and decision makers. Second, it's about installing projects faster. I've mentioned this already, but plug and play is kind of at the core of what we're going for. Over the past four years, we've, we've increased the installation speed by 4x. And we've reduced the total labor involved across both construction and manufacturing by 3x. We think that this is key to unlocking our ability to scale and our customers' ability to scale with us. We need to be laser focused on reducing that time from when the mega pack leaves the factory to when it is operational on the grid. Our culture at Tesla is anyone at any time can raise an idea or make an improvement suggestion across safety, people, cost, production, quality. Because we have a very simple process called take charge. And take charge is really employee engagement. And as take charges go up, as you can see in this graph, injuries go down. And you know why? People who do the work, the people who do the work know how to improve the work. Our vehicles use currently the heat pump based technology for the thermal system. But before heat pump, 
our vehicles used to have a dispersed thermal system connected by hoses. Engineering was inspired from circuit, circuit boards and then created a system which was extremely integrated where 60% of the system was the size of a basketball size, basketball where it contained about 100 components, 50 uh, ceiling interfaces, and several, several different manufacturing processes all were t packaged into this tight, tight size. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, we launched the system right during the outbreak of the pandemic in Model Y. The team was forced to manage 100 plus components from different suppliers around the world remotely. So, there are four videos playing at the same time. One is the video of the manual line that was created uh, when we started the production. And this manual line produced a lot of quality issues, let alone throughput. So we quickly uh, you know, pivoted to a semi-automated line. But in spite of that, although the th throughput was uh, great, uh, the quality issues sustained. So our team decided that fully automated is the only way to go. So before we automate the line, we created a 3D simulation. Now, not many companies or teams have this capability, where at this point, now when a part gets specced, we have the ability to create a 3D simulation of all the complex sub-assemblies sub that would be involved in making the part and tell the suppliers exactly what equipment to purchase, what to test, and, 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 and create an end-to-end -end line in simulation. And that's what we did here. So with the help of the simulation, uh, we had a very detailed uh, sub-assembly cell, which was juxtaposed with the, with the supplier's factory layout. And then we, uh, after a back and forth of, of iteration and optimizing the processes, we implemented this fully automated line in less than eight months. And the results were remarkable. 99% reduction in labor force. So in a line that would need 1,000 associates to build the super manifold in full volume now just takes 10, 10 associates. And the quality also went up by an order of magnitude uh, we have a defect rate of less than 0.05%, and a super manifold rolls out every seven seconds because we have created many automated lines. And these factories are the size of two football fields. So even though at the tier one level we're talking about 8,000 parts total, it seems like a lot, but it's not a lot. The management of the tier two is really where we excel, and I'd like to illustrate that with an example. Meet the car computer. Very innocent sounding name, and it's anything but. This is an absolute monster to manage. So I think you've all seen the picture on the left of the autopilot board. That's the top of the autopilot board. The autopilot board also has a bottom, and the bottom is populated heavily with components. On the other side of the heat sink, you've got the MCU, the multimedia cluster board. This board is equally complex. It's also double-sided, eight-layered. And these boards, these computers run so hot at peak operation that they have to be liquid-cooled liquid through a heat sink. So this assembly requires taking those two boards and then bonding them to a heat sink that's uh, hermetically sealed as an assembly, of course, flashing the software and all that sort of stuff. And then that's one part number that comes to Tesla. So this is an example of one tier one part number that's a very complex assembly to manage at the tier two level. And there's more than 7,000 components here. There's a, you know, as we stand here, a component's being assembled onto a car computer every 1.4 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. The line that builds this computer is the length of a football field. So it's, it's quite complicated. And initially, when we first started building this board, due to the complexity of it, we had to rely heavily on labor. But once we dialed in the quality, the rates, and the yield, we started focusing on making this more efficient. The only way to control cost is by removing labor. The first step is removing labor. The second step is fully automating. The third step is turning off the lights and letting the factory run, ideally. And that's going to be the goal for us here. So 95%, but our work is not done. We're going to be going a lot further than this. So this illustrates the point that 
a part is not a part. A part has a lot of complexity underneath it. Supply chain is, is a game of multiple tiers. And, and what's made us successful is our involvement and all the details with our supply engineers uh, that are Tesla employees. They're Tesla supply engineers. So they're like on our payroll that go and ramp up these capabilities that are suppliers. And then just managing each and every attribute of it. You know, 7,000 a day through the chip shortage, through the pandemic, through all the other stuff that we had to deal with, was, was very difficult to manage. But because we had all the details, we were able to pull this off. Um, at Tesla, we're always trying to improve every single component in the car. And a nice example of that is the 15-inch display that was originally shipped in the 2017 Model 3. Um, over time, the cost of the display has gone down 24%. We've been able to reduce the weight by 12%, and we've reduced the power by 33%. At the same time, we've increased the brightness of the display by 50% and improved the color accuracy. So this is one of our favorite things at Tesla is to make a component cheaper and better. With Cybertruck and all future Tesla platforms, we will be moving to 48 volts. This reduces the current needed by a factor of four. And since power loss in the harness is resistance times the square of the current, a 4x reduction in current leads to a 16x reduction in lost power while distributing energy in the car. Uh, that allows for smaller wires, smaller e-fuses, and smaller controllers. It also allows us to make those heat sinks smaller, or in many cases, remove it completely, all benefiting the car in terms of mass and weight. OTA updates and data insights give us the ability to iterate quickly on our software and to maximize the amount that we learn and, and proceed and, 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 and the progress that we make in every one of those iterations. We've used these capabilities to inform countless design decisions in both software and hardware. Yeah, one example is that we were able to monitor and track the use of the sunroof in our cars and found that our customers never use their sunroof. So we, we made this easy decision to remove it. We are able to use our collision data to design our crash safety systems for what happens in the real world, far beyond what regulatory and consumer ratings tests prescribe. And then furthermore, we're able to use that data to recreate in simulation all of those crashes every single time we make a change to the vehicle's design or to the software that controls the airbags and other restraint systems. Here on this graph, the gray dots that show up first are specific crash tests that are prescribed by regulatory and consumer ratings agencies throughout the whole world. And the rest of the color that fills in around and on top of it those represent the crashes that we've seen happen in the real world. Those are what we design for and what we test to. Right. And last year, this data was used to change the algorithm for seatbelt tensioning to reduce injuries in the field, which was OTA to all of our cars. We've analyzed patterns in the way the fleet drives and charges to optimally size battery packs for our next generations of vehicles. So you've heard a lot from Pete, Colin, and others about how important vertical integration is for us in hardware but it's especially important for us in software. And this is extremely difficult from the way the rest of the traditional automotive supply chain is set up. In most situations, all the controllers in the car are delivered by different tier one suppliers, whose software is written by tier two suppliers, who farm some of that software out to different tier three suppliers, and so on and so on. Making a change that spans multiple components takes months of coordination before any work can even start. And furthermore, integration of software and the server side with what's happening in our vehicles has always been a core part of our DNA and enables us to do things that nobody else can. Most engineers think about the vehicle as a complete, consolidated, fully contained system. But in the software team, we think about the system as including the vehicle as well as all of our back-end server-side applications and infrastructure and the resultant feedback loop from the entire fleet that informs all the decisions we make as an engineering team. For example, we recently released a feature in Model S and X that automatically, predictively, adjusts and raises the suspension for ride comfort before the car hits a section of rough road. So now, when a production associate plugs something into the car, the central car computer sees that connection, confirms that it's the correct part for the type of car that's supposed to be built, installs a software update if necessary, checks configurations and calibrations, and runs a barrage of tests on that thing and all the other things that are connected to it. And if it finds an anomaly that can't be fixed purely with software, it throws an alert immediately that is displayed prominently 
on the vehicle's display as well as sent to back-end command and control systems so that a human can come over and fix the problem before the rest of the car gets built on top of it. We have laid the foundation in getting ready to execute Master Plan 3. Our stra strategy is supply chain design simplification. We are going to make sure that we have more control into the tiers of the supply chain. We are going to grow responsibly and sustainably with our long-term partners, and we'll automate. Yeah, I'd say you know, going from zero to 40,000 cars a week was, was tough. I mean, it took, it took a lot of trial and error. It took a lot of learning. There was a lot of pain. There's a lot of mental scar tissue, as Elon calls it, uh, through that process. But now, now that we're at that level and the foundation is set, going from 40 to 400 is not going to, it doesn't really phase us. Uh, we have a capable team. We've got capable external partners that have you know, gone through hell with us. A leadership team is galvanized behind the mission, um, and we're going to get it done. When you are making a new product, it's not enough to think about the product itself. You have to think about how you're going to make it at scale. So Tesla, our powertrain, and our powertrain manufacturing equipment is both designed under one roof. The engineers who are designing the motor, they are in the same room as the engineers who are designing the machine that's going to put that motor together. And that collaboration pushes us from day one to design products that are not only high performance, but are really easy to assemble. In our next powertrain, so the silicon carbide transistors that I mentioned that are key component but expensive, we figured out a way to use 75% less without compromising the performance or the efficiency of the car. And of course, we know that battery cell supply is one of the constraints on the scalability of EVs right now. Our new powertrain is compatible with any battery chemistry. And that will give us great flexibility in battery sourcing. And this next part of the presentation is my favorite part of the whole thing. If you've already seen it, I still suggest that you watch it again. It's just so fascinating. So back in 2008, where we were designing Model S, we didn't have a factory. In fact, we had a really small engineering team and a tiny design team. But that allowed design to lead all the conversations. It let us innovate forward-thinking ideas, like how do you fit seven people into a sedan? Or how do you make door handles disappear into the, into the doors? Or putting a huge touchscreen into the center of the, the vehicle, something that had never been done before. And then we won Motor Trend Car of the Year. Yes, and we won <laughs> Motor Trend Car of the Year in 2013. Our first, our first you know, great award, first car. Um, pretty, good, pretty good start, kind of a home run, I think. Um, but that, that whole process resulted in a linear process that you see on the screen. We, we designed first, then we engineered, and then we figured out how to manufacture it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. When we were designing the car together, we didn't even know where we were going to build it. And so we came up with... I didn't even know Lars when we were designing <laughs> That's true. Uh, we didn't... So once we got Fremont, we were very fortunate, and we figured out the manufacturing solutions, sort of like we were flying a plane and putting the wings and building the engine at the same time. So we knew we had to do better. Yeah, we knew we had to be better in order to scale. And as part of the master plan that you've read, Model 3 needed to be a smaller, more efficient, and more affordable version of Model S. But it had to be equally great. It had to have all the things that people loved in their Model S or Model X, and, but be much more affordable. And so we, we approached the process a little bit differently than the first time around. Now we had teams that we all worked together. So we were able to combine design, engineering, and manufacturing process all at the same time. But somewhere along the way, we changed the manufacturing process to be fully automated. And so we leaned into this whole new way of manufacturing a car, but we had already engineered it. So things didn't quite go as well as planned. It was an amazing product, but it landed us in production hell. Many of us who lived through that carry those battle scars. It was a great idea, but it wasn't the right timing. Like Franz said, automating something that we designed to be built manually is super hard. And we have many, many failed examples of that at the Fremont factory that we ripped out. But some of them eventually still work. This is one I actually worked on with a small team of engineers. It's still running today. And some of the engineers that came by said we couldn't do it or no longer with the company but it's running, and it's running faster than ever. <laughs> so we kind of self-imposed constraints on the design when we were doing it to be built manually, and we really didn't think about it. 
But despite all that, Model 3 is the best-selling EV ever. Yeah, and Model Y, which is derived from Model 3, is about to pass that. But we knew we had to improve the process further. And with Cybertruck, we designed a vehicle around a vision that actually started with the manufacturing process. And in this case, the materials dictated the design. Forming full hard stainless steel isn't rocket science, but it sure isn't easy. And it limited the way we could do it. Yeah, absolutely. It really forced us to think about designing something um, in, in a way that you couldn't no normally stamp panels. You couldn't form them in a traditional way. So you ended up with very linear um, bending processes that are just not in automotive kind of language of manufacturing today. But it, it actually created a very efficient and process and one of the most dynamic designs ever, I believe. It's definitely something that's going to change the road landscape. Hopefully you guys saw it down there and you experienced it. It's definitely real. Those are real trucks. We're on our way to build them. But what that stainless steel opportunity did for us, it has let us rethink the factory footprint. We don't stamp those. That's a huge part of it. We don't even paint them. So our footprint got smaller, and we started to think about innovative ways to take those constraints and make great products. But that constraint didn't really change the end result of the truck. Um, it's a super dynamic truck, and it has all the functionality you would expect out of any of the other competitive trucks. And the best thing about it, it's coming this year. So ideally, after all that, we would design, engineer, manufacture, and plan for automation happening together. It gives us the opportunity to question requirements. This is something that is fundamentally only available at Tesla. In the places I used to work and the top manufacturing companies in the world, they don't sit together. Yeah, we are I, one team. Nowhere I know has all these teams together thinking about these processes from the very beginning. In fact, all of those engineering teams, manufacturing, design, automation, they're all in one org. They all report to one person. We can't point fingers at each other, so we have to solve them together, which is the best way to innovate. A traditional way of making a vehicle is this. You stamp it, you do build a body in white, you paint it, and you do final assembly. And what's interesting is these shops are dictated by the, the, the organizational structures that exist, and they're dictated by the boundaries that exist in the factories that are laid out. If something goes wrong in final assembly, you block the whole line, and you end up with buffering in between. This is at the tail end of its manufacturing optimization. Henry Ford first invented this assembly line in 1922. It's been 100 years, and it's really hard to make a change after 100 years. And when you watch it happen, it's actually really silly to a guy like me. You take all these stamp panels, you put them together, then you put them in a framing station, you build a body that looks something like a car, you put the doors on, and then you paint them. Once you get the color, you take the doors off, and then you start putting the interior inside the car. It comes in through the openings that already exist. I wish it went in like this big piece like yeah. this, but there's actually people coming in and out of the car. There's awkward you know, movements. Then we lift the car up. We put stuff from underneath it. We put it down. Then we put the seats in the car. And finally, we close it all out with glass, and we bring those doors that went away for a trip, and we put them back in the car. Most of the time, we're doing this with a big, giant car and moving it and doing really nothing to it at all. What's funny, though, in this kind of whole process is that just recently, Toyota just called this an engineering work of art. True. <laughs> the Model Y. That, that was humbling. But at Tesla, it's not good enough. If we're going to scale the way we want to do, we have to rethink manufacturing again. As part of the master plan, we have to make another step change in cost. We started this on Model Y when we made these huge giga castings, and we deleted hundreds of parts. We simplified assembly with the Model Y structural battery, where we decided the floor should be a part of the car. The battery is the floor. We put the seats in the interior on the battery, and we bring it up through a big open hole, and we assemble it. And this allowed us to do things in parallel fully rethinking the process and reducing the final assembly line by about 10%. And we thought, maybe we could do this other places. Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, the, the, the constraints become part of the solution rather than a problem. So when you think about what I'm trying to say, I really want to hammer this home. 
when you have a car that's about five meters long and you have people working around it like we did in Model 3, and we change that to this process where we take different parts of the car and we can do more at the same time like we did with the Model Y structural battery pack, what you see here is us doing that on the front part of the vehicle or the rear part of the vehicle. That means we can get more people working on the car, or robots, working on it at the same time. That means we have better operator density, less time doing nothing. I call that space-time efficiency. It has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. We can have that conversation later. But we get 44% more operator density, which means more work, less time walking back to the station, 30% improvement in space-time efficiency. And because we're not building it in and out of the car with those slow movements of those robots I showed you from production hell, when we go to automate it, it's going to be a lot easier. In the end, that will probably look something like this, where we balance parallel and series manufacturing in a way where we only do things that are necessary, with a much shorter final line blocking a lot less of the entire rest of the factory so we can optimize material flow using the best practices. And what that means, it's going to look something like this where we build all the sides of the cars independently. We only paint what we need to. And then we assemble the parts of the car once and only once. We put them where they need to go. The interior is ta attached from a bottom up or a top down uh, strategy, so there's more access for those robots and people. We aren't moving heavy objects around and doing nothing to it. And it means we're doing more work on the car more of the time. And then. When we take it, all of these tested sub-assemblies and we put them together, we finally assemble the car only one time, putting the sides on with all of their parts to a front and rear that was already assembled, carrying the floor in with the seats, and finally boxing it out with the doors one time, just like Cybertruck. So in the end, you get the same car, but it's not going to be a Model Y. Yeah, this is, not, yeah. This is a Model Y for illustration, not the next-gen vehicle. In the end, what does that mean? To increase the scale and adoption of electric vehicles on the orders of magnitude that we just showed you, we have to make constraints part of the solution. It leads us to greater than 40% reduction in footprint, which means we can build factories faster with less capex and more output per, per unit. Faster, less capex, more output per unit dollar. Zach's going to go into more details on this later, but it also means through this innovation and some of what my other engineering colleagues are going to talk to you about in the future, will reduce costs as much as 50%. This is the two-for-one concept you hear me and Elon talking about on earnings calls. Yeah, so I think our track record proves that we can deliver the best cars, and we deliver the best cars in spite of, because of, these constraints. You made it to the very end. Congratulations. And this is the buying opportunity for Tesla stock explained by Elon Musk. My name is Matt Posius. Like and subscribe if you haven't yet. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.